Um, we will have um, a few uh, welcoming remarks, and we will have some keynotes, and we will end the day with, uh, with a panel debate. I would just start by, first of all, introducing myself. My name is Jevim Gil Jensen. I'm coordinating the uh, Energy Poverty Advisory Hub, uh, together with a series of people in this room whom many of you might already know. Uh, the Energy Poverty Advisory Hub is an initiative under the uh, European Commission's uh, DG Energy, and uh, it has started some close, close to one and a half years old, and is sort of the uh, extension of the what you might know as the uh, um, Energy uh, Poverty Observatory. Uh, the Energy Poverty Advisory Hub has a distinct focus on uh, actions on the ground and a focus on local authorities to take the next step on energy poverty. This means that uh, I can, and I can already tell you, that we have municipalities here in the room that are very advanced, and we have municipalities in the room here that are just starting on this. And the Energy Poverty Advisory Hub, or EPA, as we call it in short, uh, are uh, uh, sort of uh, are here to uh, support both the less, uh, th those that are embarking on the journey and those that are well advanced. But before this, uh, before we will sort of dig into some more, uh, some more sort of interactive uh, activities tomorrow, uh, this conference here is also a very special element of the Energy Poverty Advisory Hub because the conference series that we are having is where we are in a room together meeting uh, different uh, levels of governance. And this you will also see as a sort of a, a very good example of with the uh, welcoming uh, speeches that we will have here. And I would be, um, I'm very pleased to have uh, uh, Dunja Vargas in the room, the State Secretary uh, for Ministry of Construction, Physical Planning and State Property. I'm very pleased uh, to have uh, Christina Schellix, Director of Energy uh, uh, of Energy from the Ministry of Environment and Energy. Uh, I'm very pleased to have uh, Baiba uh, Miltovica, who is the President of the Transport Energy Infrastructure and Information Society of the uh, European uh, Economic and Social Committee. And of course, a big thank you to Daniela uh, Dolinec, Deputy Mayor of Zagreb, who is also uh, our host for today. At the same time, also a warm uh, welcome to DJ Energy, our representative, uh, Eero Aelio, uh, who will uh, sort of uh, sum up not only with a keynote, but also as a key host message. Uh, and without further ado, I would like to, uh, to ask uh, Junior Magas uh, to come to the stage with a uh, mark and welcoming speech. Thank you. Dear organizers, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank organizers, the Energy Poverty Advisor Hub, and the Society for Sustainable Development Design for the invitation to this event. We are all aware that our everyday life and existence is exposed to many challenges. Negative consequences of climate change, intense urbanization, greenhouse gas emission significantly impact territories at the global scale. Earthquakes which hit Croatia in 2020 and storms that hit northern part of Croatia just a few, few weeks ago remind us that our lives and our built and natural environment are fragile and subject to many effects. For those reasons, we must direct our resources in designing and building much more sustainable and resilient environment. Besides challenges that impact the physical space, modern European society is faced with other challenges, such as the shrinking re regions, are aging and depopulation, social segregation, or urban poverty. Ukraine crisis faced the EU with the insecurity of energy supply and forced the European policymaker to think about alternative sources of energy and speed up the reduction of energy consumption of green transition. The insecurity of prices in the energy sector put European citizens in danger of energy poverty. 
Ministry of Physical Planning, Construction and State Assets is undertaking certain measures aiming to reduce energy poverty in Croatia. For uh, that purpose, we adopted several programs for energy renovation of buildings. During the last two years, we have ensured energy renovation of buildings for citizens who are at risk of energy poverty, and we have ensured implementation of energy renovation of multi-dwelling buildings project for energy poor citizens starting in 2022. The program for energy renovation of family houses for the period 2040-2020 was the first program actively directed to the reduction of energy poverty. This measure ensured 100% financial support to the targeted population taking, taking into account social criteria. The available financial resources to finance the implementation of this program is approximately 4 million euro. The service for future beneficiaries is based on one-stop shop approach. Public calls for project proposals are open continuously and local authorities are also invited to undertake measures for preventing energy poverty on their territories. The work on the new program for energy renovation of family houses for the period up to 2030 is underway. Its implementation will be based on the detailed analysis of our pre previous experience, the needs and priorities, especially taking into account the citizen risk of energy poverty. In the end of 2021, we adopted the program to combat energy poverty, including the use of renewable energy sources in residential buildings in assisted area and in area of special state concern. This program is financed with 48 million euro, out of which 20 million is ensured in National Recovery and Resilience Plan. The financing rate is 100%. This program will be used to renovate almost 400 residential buildings with total reduction of primary energy use of 27 gigawatts year per year on the reduction of CO2 emission around 690 tons per year. When it comes to energy renovation of multi-dwelling buildings, the relevant program has been prepared to the period until 2030. The analysis has shown that the first beneficiaries should be the ones with guaranteed minimal subsidies and 100% financing rate should be ensured for all citizens in risk of the energy poverty. I gave you a very brief overview of activities Croatia undertakes to reduce energy poverty. The prevention of this challenge requires many transitions and change of approaches in other aspects of everyday lives of inhabitants, but also business and economy. I believe that discussion that will happen today and tomorrow will bring out many questions because energy poverty is our common European challenge. Therefore, knowledge and experience exchange is welcome and very useful. I wish you a pleasant and fruitful conference. I hope thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, you really touched upon a lot of the things and uh, yeah, uh, that we will actually for sure be debating later on in, in this conference. I'd like to uh, uh, invite uh, the next speaker, director, please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues, ladies, gentlemen. I would like to welcome you in front of our Ministry of Economy and Sustainable De uh, Development, not anymore only energy, <laughs> um, and uh, also um, send the greetings from our Ministry, Dr. Filipovic, which is uh, actually now in Luxembourg, speaking about FIS 455 um, documents. Uh, we were yesterday there and together and uh, uh, ministers adopted the general approach to new directive on renewable energy um, and also the general approach to energy efficiency. 
These two documents uh, are cornerstones in the uh, future uh, development uh, of our clean and sustainable societies, uh, where we expect not to, uh, to have enough energy and to have affordable energy. Because energy poverty uh, has, consists of these two main issues, to have enough energy to supply to citizens and also to uh, make them de that energy affordable for them, not to, 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 uh, not to be dominant uh, um, expenditures in their uh, home budgets. So, the war in Ukraine has changed uh, uh, relations in the world's energy market and pressured us to find and adopt short-term um, an efficient solution to raise security of supply and sustainability, uh, sustainable energy prices in EU. You are aware of what's going now, and from the um, last uh, six, uh, six, six months, um, um, or third and fourth quarter, uh, quarter of uh, 2021, the prices of energy increased in the uh, different areas of Europe uh, for two, three times, depend on the regulation. Croatia um, luckily had that such a regulation that we, until the 1st of April, did not uh, need to intervene and we have stable regulatory framework that uh, allowed us to uh, remain with the prices of gas and electricity for households stable on the same levels. But uh, on the 1st April in 2022, we, we need to intervene as a government, as a society, society and to reduce uh, the potential um, high increase in price, uh, prices. So Republic of Croatia already introduced a number of measures in order to mitigate the pressure on both citizens and entrepreneurships who are in the risk of energy poverty due to increase uh, in energy prices after the 1st April in 22. Uh, subsidies are uh, provided for gas for citizens as well as a, a low value support for about 33,000 33, micro, small and medium sized entrepreneurs and uh, will be uh, financed by uh, revenues from uh, um, allowance under the ETS, EU ETS uh, system. Uh, so, the um, total amount of support will depend on the actual gas consumers uh, and uh, 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 this measure took about 160 million euros up to date. So, with the same aim to reducing the sensitivity of location of fossil fuel prices, the Republic of Croatia uh, intensified the carbonization program. Also, by changing the plan for the use of financial resources obtained from uh, auction of emissions allowance uh, from 21 and 25 and we need to uh, know that this uh, uh, allowance increased and the uh, price of ETS uh, system um, in the meantime uh, with the prices uh, also went up to 80, 80 euros per um, uh, ton of CO2 so from this, this uh, budget we could uh, also increase the energy efficiency uh, measures and pay uh, another 23.5 million, uh, million euros for these purposes. Also, the installation of renewable energy sources and energy efficiency measures of the most intensive industry pl uh, plants and um, heating plants will be financed over the next two years from modernization fund with the uh, first of two um, uh, locations in 2020, uh, about uh, 40 Euro, million euros for this. this uh, we, what we would like to also to, to uh, support in our national program and recovery and resilient is the city heating system, central heating systems. And one of our main major is geothermal potential that we have in the main cities where also we have the, this present, this central uh, heating system. So this is on the level of government level that, that uh, support uh, this uh, project to be carried out in this uh, 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 period up to 2025. So, also uh, the new fi uh, uh, through a cohesion fund, uh, it, it is uh, 
possibility to, to, to finance, uh, uh, finance uh, small micro solars and heating pumps for those who are changing, replacing fossil fuels um, uh, in the energy efficiency program or, or which uh, or, or those who want to, to, to just uh, to choose just to put uh, solar um, uh, so, uh, 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 solar roofs uh, to have solar roofs and to, to become uh, 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 prosumers. So um, our legislation is placed. Uh, we transport also uh, directive of renewables and energy efficiency. So everything that is uh, possible to uh, build uh, to have uh, like uh, energy communities in the EU, it is possible to to arrange and to have here in Croatia nowadays. Uh, so our potential and our strategy for new renewables is great, and we we are um, emerging this 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 part of energy, and we think that uh, it is the answer to poverty uh, of our citizens, and it is the answer also to climate change, and it is the strongest measure that we uh, uh, can carry on. So, a st strong integration of sectors and uh, cooperation among uh, us in the um, construction, in energy, in uh, agriculture, and other, also com uh, our, uh, our com good communication with municipalities on the local level, on the Spartan planning plans, which are very important for uh, further development of uh, renewable energy sources, and most important that, that uh, have this renewable energy to have uh, um, increased energy efficiency and also to, the, uh, to reduce dependence of uh, fossil fuels and uh, uh, um, uh, in, the, in the same time um, reducing poverty and enable our citizens to participate in energy transition. So, thank you for invitation once again and uh, we are uh, here in the Ministry, we are open to all discussions, to all your suggestions and I think that uh, this is just the start of the long journey to energy transition and uh, CO2 free um, societies in 2050. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director. I, I really appreciate sort of the, the, the dropping of all the different wins there are when tackling energy poverty. We're not only talking sort of alleviating poverty, but also the mitigation of, of, uh, of emissions, etc. And I, I'm sure that we're going to touch upon a lot of different wins uh, in the, uh, throughout these two days. Uh, I would now sort of uh, bid uh, Mr. President to come to the stage. I have sort of a I really appreciate the uh, the gender balance here today. It's like, yeah. Good afternoon in this wonderful city of Zagreb, and uh, indeed, it was my observation: no gender balance in the keynote speakers. Uh, panel. Um, indeed, my name is Bajba Miltovic. Uh, some think that my surname is, sounds uh, familiar in this region and so it's interesting because I come from Riga, from Latvia, which is from north, but my husband's relatives are related with this area, so, so um, yes, I'm happy to be here. Anyway, I represent a civil society house, which is European Economic and Social Committee. Uh, it is a uh, umbrella or it is how to say civil society organizations 329 civil society organizations across all the Europe and also from Croatia I have colleagues uh, in the economic and social committee and indeed uh, as Iepa mentioned uh, we are working on horizontal uh, issues and one of them is transport energy information um, uh, information society so um, energy poverty was always uh, core of my presidency, uh, an issue. I'm very happy to see, uh, and I would like to thank the uh, city of Zagreb turning attention to this uh, issue, also the government representatives being here, because me personally, working in consumer organizations, we were struggling a lot uh, with municipalities because they don't know what to do with energy poverty, because from one side it's social issue, from other side it is really purely technical uh, and infrastructure issue. 
So I'm happy to see, ladies, that you are here uh, from the construction and also energy side. Uh, and it is holistic uh, problem and we need to dedicate attention. Indeed, I will not repeat the same things. Of course, we are worried about the situation in Ukraine. We see that war is not taking short term, it's long term. So we don't know how long a time it will take uh, and last. Of course, we need to understand the consequences and energy prices is one of the consequences among many others. Uh, we need to also understand, and I see that member states, uh, because I got information from different member states, are going into the way of energy independence, uh, trying to shift to renewable uh, energies and also try to look how to mitigate energy poverty from different aspects, starting from taxes until uh, trying to find also construction contributes in this regard, regarding refurbishment and a renovation of houses, but as you know, it is long-term effect. So it's very important to keep energy transition through social dimension, always, always very important to keep it. We need to keep dialogue between local, regional and national uh, and EU level uh, players. We need to think about multi-level governance. So we need all actors involved. So as I mentioned, it is not just issue that is in is silo. We need that everybody contribute and everybody works together. First of all, uh, if, if I'm talking about support of local actors, we need to talk about energy poverty that should be mainstreamed in ongoing actions at local and regional level. Related to energy efficiency, re renewable energy, as you men mentioned, uh, solar panels on the roofs, uh, many other activities that you do and you, you support uh, from the government side. Also, we need technical assistance uh, regarding accessible information and how to assess the funding. Because sometimes to get funding is really struggle. If you, if you ever did it on your own and if you are civil society organizations, you know how difficult is administration, um, uh, administ administration in each member state to, to really get funding. We need also single one-stop shops, and I know in some municipalities there are already uh, regional uh, energy centers or energy advice centers or consumer organizations help with in this regard. Secondly, we will not move if we are not getting support from local citizens. So we really need to make sure that each citizen understands what it means Green Deal, what it means Fit for 55 package. Otherwise, I have a feeling that we live in Brussels bubble and we feed each other with this information, but, but actually general public don't, don't feel the same mood, so we need to be uh, on the same mood. We need to think about creation of energy communities and cooperatives. Great, each geographical member state have potential. You have sun. Uh, in my country, we have a lot of uh, wind, a lot of water energy. For example, like electricity is based of, on hydro, hydro power plants. So each, each country has potential and we need to bring this potential further. And we need to remember that these energy communities and cooperatives at local level can be the movers of energy transition. They can really push uh, the process and move away from the fossil fuel, um, fossil fuel companies. Uh, finally, uh, we need also dialogue between citizens, businesses, workers, consumers, decision makers. I saw that we are in the house of trade union. I think there is also trade unions in, in this house. And I feel that there are close links because we are talking about the same problems. So if energy prices hits all the, uh, I mean, inflation is because of energy prices and because of the fall prices. So we are talking about the same things. Recently, uh, in the Brussels, we had the transport sector strike for 80,000 people coming in the streets. So everything was blocked because people understand they cannot afford energy anymore. And we are not talking about only vulnerable citizens. There are also teachers. There are many other professions that were considered as average, uh, average consumers. 
So these problems are really getting a big effect. From the EESC side, um, I would like to say that we are organizing already second year the Energy Poverty Conference. Um, as you do um, here in, uh, uh, in Energy Poverty Advisory Hub, we try to, to give attention to politicians. We try to talk with governments. We try to give good examples and share good practice so that it's, it's taking place uh, quicker. Um, yes, and under the Czech presidency, because you know the Czech presidency um, will be in some days, I think, weekend. In weekend they will start uh, to do their presidency. Uh, they asked us also to, um, to do opinion on tackling energy poverty and EU resilience challenges from the economic and social perspective. So this opinion will be released uh, and we will be happy to share it uh, with all of you. And also under the Czech presidency there are more difficult topics, for example one of them about nuclear energy, whether it can contribute in the energy prices, whether it can somehow stabilize energy prices. We know that some member states are already taking, how to say, hash exercises regarding the burning the coal. Uh, you heard probably uh, in some of the countries where they said, no, 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 we will never do that. So you see that uh, each member state is really doing utmost to um, try to find uh, the best solutions. So first of all, I would like to thank our hosts here, um, Municipality of Zagreb. I would like to thank also the government representatives being here, and of course, um, Yepa Energy Poverty uh, Advisory Hub. I would like to thank you because you were always in our conferences and seminars and webinars and I don't know, many series of events, and we will continue to highlight um, the problems that people face. Thank you so much and have a good two days of discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate your emphasis on the multi-level governance as well as sort of the more horizontal on including all sectors and, and uh, sort of all the helixes of, uh, of these efforts that are needed. Uh, last but not least, this time I'll say, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm very, very pleased to, to call you here to the stand, uh, and we are very happy to be here in Zagreb, uh, and sort of you as host together with, with Dor, who's uh, a little bit of everywhere now, and you will for sure meet a lot of them. So please. Um, hello, everyone, dear guests, conference participants, colleagues. I'm very happy and pleased to be able to greet you on behalf of Zagreb's mayor, Mr. Tomislav Tomasevic, and to wish you a warm welcome to this conference that we're co-hosting as the city of Zagreb. There are a few, I will only say a few words about what I see as the context of the conference and then a few words about uh, what the city of Zagreb is doing and the efforts that we plan in the upcoming period. First of all, uh, to say a few words about the context, I think addressing energy poverty at this moment is particularly urgent uh, and it is, as it has always been, um, politically demanding and complex. It is, uh, first of all, so with regard to urgency, it is timely, it is urgent, it is uh, particularly pressing in the context that my previous speakers have already described with the effect of uh, the war in Ukraine and how it has compounded the existing crisis that we've already had with um, inflation rates rising, with a two-year um, corona and COVID uh, context. So all of this is now compounding uh, in a larger crisis that is, of, for, you know, in obvious reasons, um, much more difficult for the most vulnerable among us. So this is why I think having this conversation in the next two days is extremely important and looking for ways in which networks such as these can help us speed up what needs to be done is extremely relevant. Why it's politically demanding, I don't, I don't think that's new, that's always been the case because the, the wider issue of um, climate change, mitigation, adaptation, is a question of just transition. It means that whatever technical and other solutions uh, we discover, we need to design them in a way, uh, in a participatory way and in an inclusive way. 
because otherwise we will not get the, the support from the electorate for, for the transition that needs to happen. And I think that's why, that's another reason, which is what you said, energy transition through social dimension. And I see that particularly as, a, as an elected politician, that it's the communication and explaining and designing policies in a way that both information is available and that uh, the steps needed uh, for the transition are clear, uh, are very important. And it's complex, it's always complex because it requires co collaboration between national level where the regulations are made and the local level where I would dare say the experiences or at least the, the direct uh, contact with citizens and needs. And here the city of Zagreb as the capital city we see has um, the largest responsibility to be the motor, to be the flagship uh, of the transition that's in front of us. With respect to what is currently being done, uh, we have an acting uh, Zagreb strategy for combating poverty and social exclusion. Uh, this is a wider topic um, within our social policy, but which already recognizes um, energy poverty as one of its components. Uh, currently, the social measures uh, within this strategy target around 100,000 people. And then with the particular uh, focus on energy poverty, this uh, pertains to, for instance, energy pack packages for beneficiaries who we already identified uh, through compensation for housing costs. So there are kind of a set of measures, but I would say that uh, the city of Zagreb is learning a lot through its cooperation with DOR. There has been a number of projects which have helped us um, with you know, practical design of measures and activities. And as a result, I would say of that experience, we are now initiating a creation of a first dedicated energy poverty mitigation program. This is something that we have committed as the city of Zagreb to adopt, uh, so first develop and then adopt at the city assembly uh, level uh, to address kind of this whole complex that I've just described. In designing such programs, um, one of the things, one of the needs that we have identified is for data, good quality data for the city of Zagreb because a lot of the social policy generally is um, developed based on national indicators and, it, and so we need to, to also develop better policy, um, and better data about social policy in general, but with the technical assistance that we received uh, through the European Poverty Advisory Hub, we will focus particularly on um, developing and uh, creating new data to help us better target uh, measures regarding um, energy poverty. So this is something that brought together, I think will take the city's uh, efforts to the next level, which is how you opened the conversation today, um, and for the benefit of those uh, most vulnerable among us. So I will end here. I will wish you a very fruitful and engaging two-day conference and also take the opportunity to apologize for not being able to stay with you for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. It's, it's true, we know that you have a busy schedule and that you, you will have to leave a little in advance, but we really appreciate uh, your time here now and. Uh, and, uh, and also really appreciate the descriptions of basically the mitigation program, which is no secret. There is a good reason for us to be in Zagreb today. You are doing quite a magnificent job. You are having a very strong relationship relation with, with DOOR. And, and, and it's clear that uh, we would also like from, from the Energy Poverty Advisory Hub to also display this way of collaborating because it's, it's essential to move things forward. Um, with this, I would like sort of to, now we're moving into the next segment, which is sort of uh, key, uh, key notes, key hosts, and inspirational talks. And I would like uh, to, to uh, call uh, Eero Ailio to the, to the stage from Digena. And uh, yes, maybe you can, you can introduce yourself more in detail. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you indeed. So, uh, um, Eero Ailio is my name, indeed, I'm a Finn. I work at the European Commission and uh, at DG Energy as an, as an advisor of, uh, uh, on uh, a number of things, but uh, just transition and energy poverty actually happens to be in the remit of that the directorate, so it kind of fits, fits quite nicely. So, uh, it's really good to be here. I'm, I'm enjoying this, it's my third time in Croatia. 
Uh, usually these are the kind of lightning visits. Today is not much different. I need to leave tomorrow. But uh, it's the first time I'm in the semi-tropical Zagreb. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a new facet of this country that I see. Um, right, well, dear State Secretary and the Deputy Mayor who just left, Director and all the Baiba and all the welcome speakers and of course you are in the audience, you are the key people here anyway. Uh, so it's uh, um, my pleasure here now to speak a bit about the political uh, sort of picture uh, in which energy poverty uh, enters. And uh, um, I think some of the speakers before have already done half my job, so this is getting much easier now. Um, but still, frankly, I mean, in January this year, I had no clue. I mean, really, no idea. I had no idea where we would be standing like only a month later, and particularly today, uh, after uh, uh, Mr. Putin rolled his tanks into, into Ukraine. And I don't think, by the way, he had much of a clue either where he would be today So uh, in this uh, adventure. Anyway, uh, the obvious casualties of the Ukrainian invasion are women and children. And uh, those are the ones who had to flee the country when, uh, when the men stay behind and uh, are defending the country uh, for, uh, and, and the independence. And now, you know, you might ask what does that has to have to do with, with energy poverty, but obviously it has everything to do with energy poverty. Because you know, as well as I do, that usually women and children and the elderly are the most vulnerable uh, part of the society. So they are the ones who suffer from energy poverty, and, and uh, the uh, current war is going to make things worse. I mean, that's the reality. So by the end of this year, I don't want to see the statistics, but uh, I think they are going to change in the wrong direction. And uh, like a number of people here mentioned already, uh, it all started, or well, actually this war started in the middle of our rising energy prices already. At that time, it was the pandemic recovery. We were in the order of 200%, the wholesale prices up from normal, so doubling. And, uh, and then, like pretty much a week after uh, the start of the aggression, so uh, the prices of gas and, and oil went up in the order of 500 percentage points, which is like 700, even 800 at one point. And that's wholesale markets. And that's fossil fuels. But still, fortunately, all of that did not carry over to the retail side, as we just heard indeed from the uh, Croatian government here. Uh, so there is a filter. And in this case, it's, it was great to have that filter. However, you know, and I have seen it, my, my bill, my 90-year-old mother saw her bill actually become seven times the normal. She's on a, on a dynamic price uh, electricity back in the, up in the high north. So this thing is going to hit, and, and we see this, uh, this situation happen, happening today. And uh, um, the, okay, my, that, that gives the perspective for the end of the year that I already mentioned. Now, um, a little step back, four years ago, around four years ago, I was drafting the articles on energy poverty in the electricity directive. Uh, this was the time we were talking about the clean energy package, where we were you know, upgrading energy policy um, uh, across the board. And uh, at that time, there were still people in the room, in the council, uh, the EU council, who did not really think that energy poverty is a some kind of a European problem. It's a problem for some countries, but not for the EU on the whole. Well, I think now things look better in the sense that there is pretty much a unanimity on that. And I noticed it in Helsinki last week. I was there, one of the countries which was not very much listening to this. And I see this on newspapers. So that's something, you know, things have evolved. And that's good because you need this awareness to get some action really uh, uh, happening. So today we have indeed a legal framework to address energy poverty. It could be stronger, but it's certainly much better than it was there in the past. And uh, uh, part of that 
framework is also going into dealing with the root causes of the problem and, and one of them is obviously uh, poor efficiency, energy efficiency of buildings. You know, it, it's in, in this, this city, it's in, 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 in thousands of other cities, in, in Europe as well, the same thing. So, um, in that legislation today and also in the current, this Feed for 55 package that we're talking about, that's a package where we again upgrade the laws in order to get to this famous climate neutrality by 2050 and have a mid-term target uh, in 2030. So we're doing that work. So there you have a lot of focus on renewables, on solar, uh, uh, solar energy, on wind energy, and, uh, and all of that. And of course, Putin amplified our challenges here. So because of that situation, back in October last year, we, the Commission published the so-called, uh, we call it toolbox communication, basically uh, a paper uh, uh, explaining to the member states that you might want to do this and this and that as emergency measures to sort of soften the blow on, on citizens and on companies, on SMEs of these rising energy prices. And then we had no war still. So then we fast forward to, to March this year and then obviously we're in the middle of the, uh, the war situation and like I explained, so Repower EU uh, joint action is published and this is like Commission's vision on, on how to deal with this situation that we have to cut the dependency on Russian uh, oil and gas and do it fast. Basically, with the proposals by then, we were looking at like 30% less Russian fossil fuels by the end of, uh, by, by 2030, but now we have to do more. So that's, uh, that's the difference between Fit for 55 and Repower if you look at these kinds of two big initiatives of the, of the EU. And, uh, in, um, in this sort of emergency toolbox, uh, you had many things like reduced taxation, uh, direct income support was mentioned, I think, here somewhere. Also, um, loser state aid in order to help SMEs from going bankrupt and, and, and things like that. So many of the member states have taken up these measures. We've heard here what, what Croatia has done and, and many others are doing. And that's good because you have to sort out this acute situation. But then, um, really, next to all that, so the more important part is on how to solve the problem in a more longer term. Because these kinds of crises, they are really bad for the whole economy and certainly for the energy poor. And uh, in this kind of a longer term, that's where the mid-term measures of repower come in. And there it's really ramping up the goals to, uh, related to uh, uh, energy efficiency, of course, but also to renewables, and indeed those uh, decisions yesterday at the Council uh, were very important because that's, we're one step ahead, although I think we need to still have the discussion on, in the trilogues on, on the small things, but okay, we leave that. Um, and uh, um, the, this way, when, when we developed this uh, action plan, and there was a, a, actually after this policy in March, in May then, you know, 18th of May, very important day, it's my name day, so you know. Uh, so at that day, there was a plan then published uh, by the Commission on how do you know, start making this happen, in these great ideas, how to make it happen in practice. And uh, here it was all about diversifying first energy supply. So like between now and the end of the year, the next winter, you can't just sort of switch over to renewables all of a sudden. Right? We are way too dependent on fossil. So let's find people or countries who actually uh, we could buy uh, gas from and oil and all that to survive uh, this short term part. And that's, that's the, device, the diversification. But then also at the same time, let's develop ideas on renewable gases, on bio, bio gases, hydrogen, and things like that, so that we can actually get to little by little that part to grow a lot. And that's where there was push. We set various targets on you know, how much hydrogen, green hydrogen to produce and all these kinds of things, biogas and things like that. And, and, and this is like already going to the next level. And I think you know, biogas is interesting because there, if we get this production uh, you know, uh, increasing, so then we have farmers, we have the waste management companies of cities who are becoming actually energy producers. 
That's been already done, it's nothing new, but it's too small scale. So we have to now scale it up big, big time. And then, indeed, energy efficiency renewables have to be deployed, and again, massively now. We're not just taking little by little. And, uh, and, and there, practically, okay, it's about solar panels on the roofs. I didn't see too many coming from the airport to here, and I think I see a lot of sun. Um, you know, I think there's some things to do. But if you do it, do it smarter than I did. I had solar panels installed at my house last year. I was so happy. And then this year, I had an expert who comes to my place. I asked him, you know, what more can I do in terms of, you know, insulation? And he said, well, first of all, you should have insulated your roof better. There's not enough there. But now you've got the panels. It's a bit complicated. And uh, so I was stupid. Don't be as stupid as me. So first renovate and then put the panels or do it at the same time. That's one thing. Anyway, so then district heating, excellent thing. We need to just put the fuels, change the fuel mix, not just gas. Other things, again, uh, um, more renewable ones. And then um, the public transportation is also super important and the big investments are needed there. And then the energy communities, the uh, uh, renewable energy communities, all the citizens' energy communities, which is already a, like a legal right, and these are popping up more and more, and there should be much more. It. And why is that actually relevant when it's poverty? I heard the story. I was talking to um, a guy who's running the um, a network of energy uh, uh, communities, and he told that one important thing is that when you do this on a community basis, you are not actually aiming at the kind of margins, profits that a normal electricity company would. So you're doing it you know, with different values and usually more social, more community and all that. So that means that what you produce, you sell actually with a lower margin, lower price. So clearly, uh, people who are living within the reach of such a community can enjoy a lower energy price and this community influence on it. So it, has, it actually helps as well on, on um, on energy poverty. Now, um, yeah, okay, yes. and of course we need these large projects, wind and solar, that goes without saying. So how do we get all this done? Well, you have to think of various things. First thing is, I think about places like this, the city. It's the local and regional authorities. For us, these are super important players here. I'm not, and I'm not just saying it because I happen to be, a, you know, uh, visiting uh, Zagreb here. But we've noticed that usually the local authorities, they're the ones who basically how they know how to make renovation or, or you know, installing of panels or things like that. They know how to make that happen. They know also what the problems are there, what are the barriers from it, you know, accelerating. And then they are the ones that, in our case at least, they're the ones who turn this, these policies actually into some results, concrete things in the... Uh, on, on the ground, and it's it's clear that you know this is a big driver why we support initiatives like the Covenant of Mayors, like now the the new kid on the block, which is called the uh, uh, 100 Climate Neutral and Smart Cities. And by the way, Zagreb is a member of both initiatives. And then also the Clean Energy for EU Islands. Jeppe wants me to mention that because he used to work for that. And uh, and obviously the Energy Poverty Advisory Hub. That's, that's, that's clear. So we need this uh, uh, involved. And while I say that, I'm here in front of the state, state secretary, so I could not say something about the central government because it is clear that those same local authorities tell me often that we would like to do this and this and that, but there is this problem at national level or whatever, da, da, da. So it's clear that the central governments have to you know, allocate resources in a smart way, develop the policies and the legislation and so on. And I'm sure that's happening here, but that, that's like, it's about these multi-level governance uh, um, issues. Okay, so, uh, so the first point was indeed local regional uh, authorities. Second thing is permitting. We have to get that simpler. And this is something that's in the repower package. So we want to speed up permitting procedures. We are setting some limits to it as well, how long they can last and then also improve the awareness of, of people and companies about uh, these kinds of uh, processes, you know, how to, how to go about 
seeking permits. Third point is, and that concerns SMEs in particular, um, we've um, invited these kinds of uh, member states to set up these kinds of local and regional one-stop shops for energy efficiency and renewable deployment. And I think I heard that uh, Croatia has already taken a step in that direction, so that's, that, that's really good. Uh, the fourth point I mentioned is indeed this uh, recast of the energy efficiency directive. Um, so there are some, th there's actually a new chapter there on energy efficiency in the public sector. So some goals for public buildings and, and, and things like that to reduce again consumption. And also renovation of buildings towards near, near zero energy building level. And, uh, and, and, and then also issues about public procurement, you know, how to get more green procurement and things like that. And by the way, I read on the way here uh, a thing about zero uh, emission buildings versus the kind of like standard low level that we have in Europe. And, and the article says that the energy consumption of a uh, zero emission building is one tenth of that of a normal one. So it's one to ten. So, you know, it makes you think that, well, it, it's pretty good if we go towards that direction uh, quite soon. And it's, of course, easier with new buildings than, than uh, old ones like this one, for instance. Okay, uh, then there's, um, there are many actions inside the energy, uh, energy performance of buildings directive. That's about like renovation of houses, houses buildings. And uh, that's so much so that that's kind of like the focus uh, of much of this uh, transition work now and uh, also supports the renovation wave activity that uh, we um, uh, are seeing today, for instance, if you go across the water to, um, towards Italy. Um, now, these solutions are not just about energy, so um, there's also the issue of green urban mobility, so transport plays a big, big role in this and actually improves the life quality of us who live in cities. There we go. You know, while we do all that, we have to make sure that it happens in a just manner. The just transition was mentioned here. And that's totally connected now with energy poverty. So these two issues are connected. Actually, energy poverty is a dimension of just transition. And, and that's good because it gets much more uh, political visibility because of that. And that's what we need indeed. And uh, again, there, it's the obvious. The local communities are the ones who know who are the people who need help. So if you want something to work, you need them in the picture. That's, that's clear. I mean, from Brussels, we can't do much. It's the local people who know. That's, that's the way it works. And then now, that's the policy. Now, how to pay for all of this? So a um, couple of words on that, not a lot. Uh, obviously, cohesion policy was mentioned here. I think there's 300 billion euros or something like that foreseen on that over the next seven years. And uh, that's like the, the big source. And there, indeed, central government is in a key role to allocate that, uh, um, that money. And then local uh, municipalities and regions then to implement it in, the, in, the, in a smart way. And there's also the uh, recovery and resilience facility. So the recovery plan, Croatia has one. All the member states have one. So that is really what counts for today, what counts for uh, energy poverty, because that's big money. Those are decisions that have to be taken now, money that needs to be spent by uh, you know, 2026. So that's really the one that counts. On top of that, there is, for instance, the LIFE program. Um, I think it's one billion for the next seven years. That's very interesting stuff for uh, cities who want to do like very concrete energy transition things on renewables, on whatever, energy efficiency, energy communities. It's very concrete stuff and the calls uh, to apply for that money are on now, and there's another one coming up very, uh, very soon later this year. So these are open. There's also the EU city facility helping with financial concepts, uh, you know, for getting, getting cities going, and uh, and then the Elena facility, local authority facility that you know from covenant context. This is for big, bigger investments, like you know, up from 40 million euros and so on. So these are the kind of tools which are there, and then there's one missing the Climate Social Fund. This is a proposal as part of uh, you know, things which are negotiated now. There's a, it's a hot topic. There's quite a fight about that. Uh, we proposed 72 billion. I hear the numbers are shrinking a little bit in the council. Um, 
we will see how that will pan out. But the point with that fund is that this is exactly there to help the vulnerable people in this transition. So it's kind of like designed for that. And the, the money was to be taken from these famous uh, ETS allowances. So let's see how that works out. I'm at the end here. I think that was the regulatory picture of, of uh, all of this. And I think we, you know, to make that happen, we need these innovative people, smart people, and who want to get things done. And I think there's a lot of those in, in this room. So I'm really, uh, you know, hoping that during these couple of days, we actually come up with some good ideas that we could then, you know, spread around. And it would be the Energy Poverty Observatory, of course, to do that. But we will do it in, in things like speeches like this that we make every once in a while. So thank you very much for this. And uh, let's continue with the program. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, um, so uh, now we sort of have the, the sort of the broad lines. Uh, and uh, I will now ask uh, Louis Sunderland from the Regulatory Assistance Project to, to, to take the floor uh, and, uh, and provide us with, uh, with some, let's say, uh, more uh, local uh, experiences to sort of tie in the knots here. Thanks so much. Um, wow, this is a tough slot, isn't it? The six. The sixth of six speakers is a, a really difficult, um, there's almost nothing left to say, but I'm going to try and find something. And when I was first invited um, a while ago to come and speak here, I, I was really excited about it, really excited to meet all of you. I'm, I'm actually really pleased. There's the majority of people here I don't know, which is quite unusual. I spent 15 years working in energy poverty, mainly in the UK, and then moving in the last kind of four or five years to European level. And um, I'm just massively heartened to see loads of people that I don't know and that I can learn from and um, that I don't speak to every day as, as we kind of tend to do in our Brussels bubble. Um, when I was invited to speak, I spent the last sort of two or three weeks trying to think, okay, how do I be inspiring? You know, is there a quote? Is there a photograph? Is there a song? And I spent ages worrying about it. And actually what I realized in the end is that actually it's not about me being inspiring. It's about me turning the mirror around and actually casting a light on some of the really great projects and programs that are out there that have been t tried, that have been proven within our community. Um, so I, I will mainly focus on that. Um, before I do, I just want to say a little bit about a few words about the experience of individual households at the moment, um, which is not the inspiring bit, but it's really important context, I think, for when we think about our responses to the energy price crisis. Um, so we've already heard, you know, wholesale energy prices are going through the roof, have been going through the roof, and eventually, uh, at different times in different countries, dependent on the regulatory environment, they will hit consumer bills, they will hit household bills. Um, and just to give you an example from where I'm from in the UK, households where we're actually we're very reliant on gas for our heating, the majority of households use gas for our heating, households face, will be facing bills this winter coming that are double the bills that they were last winter. So for their combined heat and electricity bills, they will be paying double. And this is obviously incredibly significant. And I should say this is despite the price cap protection measures. So this is even despite national price protection measures that, that, that these bills will be double, doubling. And of course, this is for households who are already rationing energy, have been rationing energy for you know numbers of years. Um, and the other thing I would say about wholesale price, prices is, at the moment is that without a crystal ball to stare in, and I know it's always a bad idea to try and predict future energy prices, but the, the future uh, gas prices do look, the predictions are that they will potentially go down from these very, very big highs we have at the moment, maybe in 2023, maybe in 2024, but we don't know because we don't know what will happen with the, the uh, war. But the most important thing is they are not predicted to go down to the same levels before the crisis. So we do have a reality, an ongoing reality, of higher prices for fossil fuels, particularly gas, than we've been used to. So I think that's a really important context point for our response to this crisis, is that, is that the crisis, 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 the extreme part, might be relatively short, as in a few years, 
but actually we will not go back to business as usual. And that's really significant. Um, so just to tell a little bit more about the, the situation for households is that what these, these figures around you know, doubling of energy bills hide is that actually um, when energy prices go up, we know the prices of all sorts of things go up. Anything that uses energy in its manufacture or its transportation, the price of that will go up. So for households actually, um, the situation is, is much worse. And for low income households, we know they are disproportionately burdened by any price increase because any price increase is a larger proportion of their budget. But also, in absolute terms, we know that low income households tend to pay more for basic goods and services than their, thank you, than their better off neighbours. And this is because there are multiple different structural inequalities that pre-exist the, pri the price crisis that we're in now that stack up to, to leave uh, lower income households worse off. That could be, we know lower income households disproportionately live in the most inefficient homes. They are particularly rural communities, low income rural communities very often rely on, on very, very expensive fuels for heating in particular. Um, they may live in areas of poorer infrastructure, sorry I should be further away from that, poorer infrastructure, um, both public transport infrastructure and other infrastructure like access to shops and large supermarkets where uh, lower cost food is available. All the way through, um, and of course rather, you know, obviously uh, reliant on, on lower income jobs. And so all of this adds up to, to what's been termed the poverty premium, where low-income households pay more for, for basic goods and services. They pay more for their energy services. Uh, they pay more for food. They pay more for transport. We, very much working in the energy field, often don't think about these other elements of households paying, paying more for food, households paying more for insurance, households paying more for access to finance. And so this is the real situation for uh, households at the moment. We are in an energy crisis, but of course they are experiencing much bigger than an energy crisis. And the term cost of living crisis is used, I don't think that's a big enough term to really capture the reality. Um, so the, I'm painting this picture really because it does help us think about um, how we need to respond to this crisis. Very clearly, the crisis response that we're seeing from the majority of countries, quite rightly, which is to help people pay these higher bills, is essential. It is essential, but it is not enough. So we also need, at the same time, to be putting much more investment, designing programs, getting programs up and running and scaled that address these fundamental structural inequalities. Um, and this is where the good bit comes. This is the good news is that we actually do have, you know, a huge number of really um, inspiring projects to call from. Um, and I'm looking at the um, e EPAH's recent publication. I'm also looking at publications that, that collect um, these examples from, from other sectors. So from the housing sector, for example, incredible number of really inspiring projects in the housing sector. I'm just going to pick on, on three of the things that I've really been struck by is that these are groups of projects that address energy poverty, but they also address other basic structural in, in inequalities in our, in our communities. Um, and the first are projects that, uh, and actually we have our, one of our host organizations, DOOR, to, to thank for many of these projects actually, a lot of inspiration coming from there. These are projects actually now thankfully are in a lot of places in Europe that provide energy advice, energy audits, small renovation support to households, but at the same time they are building capacity, skills and jobs within those communities to deliver those services. So you're really keeping a lot of the benefit in that community. And as I say, building long-term jobs in, um, in growth sectors like the clean energy transition. It's incredibly important in, in transition regions, for example. Um, and I see these kinds of projects as actually a real opportunity uh, in, in the emergency response because we know they are, re they are relatively scalable relatively quickly. We don't need people to go through three years of training or five years of apprenticeship to support households to, for example, install loft insulation, shading, uh, draft proofing, low energy lighting. We know communities, neighbours can be supported to support each other to do these things, which means in our emergency response, these kinds of programmes can get, get around some of the bottlenecks we currently have in our professional supply chain. So we do have 
limits in our professional installer supply chains at the moment, which uh, will hold us back in this time of emergency from deploying a lot of these measures. The more measures we can deliver non-professionally with support and training, the better. So this is the first area that I find really exciting. Um, the second area is, a, is a, a whole group of projects that look at renovating buildings while at the same time increasing the supply of affordable housing in areas of housing shortage. And here I'm particularly thinking about the um, uh, uh, social rental agencies that exist in Belgium, but also I've recently come across a brilliant project in the Basque region of Spain. And, and these are projects that either take vacant homes or homes owned by very small landlords who can't afford to renovate. And in return for funding the renovation, they contract that home to be offered at below market rent. So under the uh, management of the agency. So providing uh, more efficient homes, but also more efficient homes at affordable rent levels. And then finally, the last area of projects um, uh, on the weather that we have at the moment uh, and where we are today really relevant is, is a huge and growing number of projects now taking advantage of um, the, the swiftly reducing cost of uh, uh, small scale renewables, particularly rooftop solar. Uh, and, and these projects are deploying rooftop solar, uh, small scale rooftop so top solar into communities and using the generated electricity to provide either free or reduce cost electricity to low income households in the vicinity of the installation. Um, and I think the other really interesting layer um, on these projects is that uh, many of the projects are developing really interesting innovative finance models. So we have the revolving fund developed by Port Port uh, Porto Torres, a municipality um, that's kind of well known now, I think. Also, crowdfunding um, being explored with a, a social fundraising campaign by Le Gambiente. I apologize to anyone that's Italian in the room because I'm sure that pronunciation wasn't very good. Um, all the way through to the kind of more uh, familiar now community funding models through community energy uh, programs. And, and I'm would point to my neighbourhood uh, community energy programme in South East London um, where there is enough sun to um, develop it, it, solar installations to reduce costs for low income households. So the examples are there. We've also heard about one-stop shops, um, really important, all sorts of other programmes um, uh, going on uh, around Europe at the moment and, and all those are really important. However, we can't only have action at the local level. We really need this coordinated action all the way through um, and uh, an action that addresses some of these structural inequalities. I would say at the EU level, we have made big strides, I think, recently with the 55 package. We are seeing, I think, uh, more than ever, um, climate, the benefits of climate programs being directed and being targeted and being guaranteed for low income households. And I think those elements across the Energy Efficiency Directive, the Buildings Directive, must be sustained through the negotiations that, uh, that are going on. If there are ways to improve them, then, then that would be also be great. We've heard today from our hosts um, that big decisions need to be made at national level. I think there are serious considerations about reprioritization of EU and national funds where in our climate measures we've normally looked for the cheapest savings, the most cost-effective savings in the easiest sectors. These programs don't include low-income households very often because these are the hardest savings. They are more costly energy savings very often to find. Um, so we really need to overturn that and put low-income households first in the list of beneficiaries of our climate programs rather than last as I think they have been. And the last thing I think I'll say is obviously the local and regional level is where it all comes together. And there we do need extra resource and capacity. Uh, I just saw, I think it was two weeks ago, a report from Energy Cities that uh, identified a huge human resources gap at municipality level. Um, and they quantified that as on average two and a half full-time equivalents in every municipality across Europe are needed between now and 2030 to deliver on our goals. So. This is a, an issue I'd love to be able to solve in the next couple of days. Um, I mean, other than kind of cloning everyone in this room and, and sending them back off, I'm, I'm not sure we are going to solve it, but I think there are ways that we can uh, learn to share our, our experiences, our tools, network better, figure, find out new partners at local level as well as our networks at, at European level. Um, and so I guess 
I would really like to think about how this response to this emergency situation that we have now can be a springboard actually for this much bigger movement of addressing structural inequalities that lead to energy poverty and moving from these small scale projects into much more, uh, a much more socially just energy transition at a larger scale. Thank you very much, Louise. I, I sort of I scribbled so much down. I don't know really where where sort of like I should hook onto something. Uh, but I like this idea of like that we need to somehow learn from when we are putting out the fires of the existing crisis that we at the same time use this experience to ensure that they do not occur in in the future. I think that's it's quite quite an important uh, uh, sort of closing remark you had there. Um, it's a bit of lack of, act, uh, of oxygen here. We're a bit, we're a bit, uh, we're a bit behind program, but I guess that's tradition. Uh, but we would still like to give you the opportunity to breathe and take just five minutes where there will be a, a glass of water out there, so we know that you'll be a bit more focused when we come back to the panel debate. So, uh, if you can count to exactly uh, uh, 300 uh, seconds, I'll be pleased to see you in here again in five minutes.
So the uh, the the, uh, the program is is rushing right now, and we're a little behind schedule. So uh, so I think uh, uh, we should basically uh, kickstart this very briefly, meaning that I will shut up and give the floor to the panelists. Each of them will present themselves and their organisation. Uh, so you will see that's why we deliberately have not put organisations underneath. But we have two city representatives. We have a representative from a, a National uh, Energy Poverty Observatory. We have uh, the Economic and Social Committee. And we have two representatives from the uh, European Commission, which is DGTRC and DG Employment. And uh, I will now mute my, my uh, microphone and we will now have sort of an introduction from each of these and you will experience that we, after this round, have touched upon uh, more or less all levels of governance. And that is a good start for uh, extending our dialogue with a question and answer session both from you and uh, you're also welcome to pose questions to each other because uh, that is sort of the whole idea of uh, increasing the dialogue. But uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, Manuela, I will give you the floor to begin with. Oh, yes, I thought that you were starting from... <laughs> okay, so hello everyone. I am Manuela, I'm from Milano Municipality. I'm from the Environmental uh, Transition Agency. So we are supporting the municipalities on many topics, like, for example, topics related, topics related with energy. About Milan, uh, many of you know Milan, it's uh, the economic capital of Italy, it's in northern Italy, 1.4 million uh, inhabitants. We are uh, relatively rich with, uh, with respect to many other cities in Italy. And we are engaged in uh, many international initiatives, so we have a really rich environmental agenda. Uh, but, uh, and also, as a tradition of the city, we are very uh, paying attention to the, the, well, the welfare and the well-being of, of our citizens. And, for example, we have very uh, advanced social policy, especially in the field of uh, social housing. Um, about energy, we have some weaknesses because, as uh, it happens uh, almost everywhere in Italy, we are really depending on gas. So we are, the energy for the city is like 90% gas-based, even if we have district heating, that is also gas-based. So you can imagine now with the spike of the price uh, of the gas, we are in a very uh, serious situation in terms of uh, rising uh, the, the, the bills, the cost of, uh, of the energy. Um, I said we, were in, we are engaged in environment, yes, because uh, we have some issues like the RA, air uh, pollution uh, together with uh, so this dependency on fossil fuels. This is why we have some plans and action in place and since this year uh, after the SECAP we put in place the air and climate plan. So this air and climate plan is tackling main issues like air pollution but also climate mitigation and climate adaptation. And within this uh, um, air and climate plan there is a strong emphasis on the transition as a just transition. So looking at at, uh, taking uh, care of our vulnerable citizens. Within the actions that we have in, the, in this uh, energy, and is in this air and climate plan, uh, we are reduce, increasing the energy efficiency with a target to decrease by 50% the carbon footprint uh, in uh, public buildings. And public buildings in, includes both schools, of course, or offices and everything, but also our social housing. So we are going to refurbish progressively or uh, our uh, public uh, social housing uh, part uh, from now to 2030. And this will be based mainly on the national uh, uh, tax incentives and bonuses that are available, but also uh, through new financing mechanisms. And that's why we are now looking to find opportunities for new financing mechanisms. Uh, we are trying also to decarbonize our energy, energy supply, trying to promote uh, um, fuel pumps uh, wherever it's possible. And we luckily can uh, use also groundwater because uh, we are in a good condition to use the groundwater. And of course, uh, renewable energy through promoting photovoltaics. We are uh, uh, promoting uh, uh, renewable energy communi communities 
The municipality is taking the leadership, so we want to bring the good example. We are planning to have like 10 megawatts photovoltaic by 2030, mainly on public buildings, and uh, use this uh, surplus of uh, energy production also to promote uh, local energy communities. Within uh, our uh, uh, air and climate plan, uh, we look also at districts, and so we would like to promote carbon neutrality also at district level, and we are promoting uh, some projects at district level, mainly look at, uh, looking at uh, main regeneration areas in the city. So areas, for example, of uh, previous uh, um, rail yards or uh, previous industrialized areas, we are refurbishing them and building uh, new mixed activities, including, of course, housing. And uh, in our uh, uh, urban planning regulation, we have an obligation to have 40% social housing. So we expect to have in the coming years new social housing buildings, all net zero energy and uh, net zero emission buildings. Um, so about energy poverty, so as I said, we are tackling more energy poverty from the energy side, and now we are also discovering more that uh, other departments in the municipality are looking at the poverty side. And so the next step of our roadmap will be to merge the actions of the more social services department and energy depart departments. But I will explain later about this. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Well, as sort of a co-host here, a warm welcome from my side. Uh, I am Ivan from the city of Zagreb. I am the city's head of energy and climate from the City Office for Economy. I'm the overall coordinator of energy and climate policy within the city of Zagreb. And similar to what the uh, city of Milan uh, is going through, we are, we are also facing numerous challenges, of course, as the capital city of Croatia. We are, uh, as, as our keynote speaker dutifully noted, uh, seemingly a tropical city from this week onwards. So uh, this heat wave, we are at the start of a very, very intense heat wave uh, in June, which is, which is not that uh, usual. So again, um, city of Zagreb, we are close to 800,000 inhabitants. The wider uh, metropolitan area is close to a million. The challenges are basically well known I think all, all European capitals have, have more or less similar uh, challenges because of size, previous, previous developments and builds. I won't go that much into detail about um, the overall energy and climate uh, initiatives that uh, we are doing and have been doing, um, but to, to put some interesting points uh, that are related to the energy poverty are that we are one of the selected as a matter of fact, the only selected city from Croatia to be part of the EU mission cities for climate neutral cities by 2030. So that's very uh, that's a proud uh, moment for us, but also a very challenging moment because similar to Milan, um, our primary energy and final energy consumption is mostly gas based. So again, um, something that was a crowning achievement of energy policy throughout the 20th century because don't, don't uh, forget during the 20th century, during um, the time where coal and hard oils and everything was in, in, in high use, basically our uh, forefathers have, have decided to uh, basically use gas to improve air quality back in the 20s, 30s and 40s in the, in the 20th century. So city of Zagreb has a long tradition from 1860s onwards to using natural gas first for lighting and then for heating, and then something which, which was, you know, a crowning achievement in the 20th century is, of course, now one of the biggest um, obstacles uh, regarding future decarbonization efforts. So that is something that we are, of course, uh, fully aware of. Uh, we do have some district heating within the city, but the city is absolutely dominated by natural gas in terms of both primary energy use in the city's electricity co-generating power plants as well as um, in, the actual, in the actual gas distribution network that goes to close to 300,000 households here in the city. So again, we did a complete overhaul of our energy and climate policy back in 2021. We developed 
uh, an in-depth IPCC um, uh, uh, certified, I'll say, uh, emissions inventory on the city level, which I think is really important because we don't now rely on the national uh, statistics and database for all the greenhouse gases uh, in, the, in the city area, but we do have our own inventory and, and data sources where, by which we can then measure our, well, let's say, success or, or, or failure in, in decarbonizing various activities. So there's a lot of going. There's there's a lot of activities going on, especially under the Fit for 55 umbrella. The city can only do so much. Uh, national governments are the one lead, are the ones leading the charge, participating in the in the overall discussions in the European Council and the Commission. But of course, we as a local, the city of Zagreb is actually a unique situation in Croatia where we're both a local and a regional authority. We are the only ones who have that um, status as the capital city. So we are one of the 21 counties in, in Croatia, uh, a regional authority, but we're also a local authority. So given the size and importance of the city, we're, I think, a uh, third of the GDP, a uh, quarter of a population. So Croatia, in terms of what Zagreb does, matters for the country as a whole. So coordination with various ministries and, and, and everything we do basically depends. Um, our success or failure also means, let's say, Croatia's success and failure in much of, in much of uh, the ongoing, ongoing policy interventions. Uh, for the energy poverty side, of course, we'll have the whole panel surrounding that, but actually we started, we do have, like the Deputy Mayor said, we did have energy poverty as part of an overall social policy, but we decided sometimes last year basically to, to, to use uh, 2021, uh, sorry, uh, uh, 2022 to basically develop a dedicated energy poverty mitigation program for the city. This was before the war, before the inflation shock, before everything. Actually, I'll give you a little bit of secret. The, 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 the reason I started it was actually ETS2. So all the changes coming from the, from the then new Fit for 55 documents. When we did a first pass of it, we were like, wait a minute, this will hit people really, really hard if we don't do something to, to, to mitigate uh, the various policy impacts that will come, you know, 2025, 6 or, or, or whatever, they were supposed to come back in the or, or original version. So the program was started more on a, on a, on a forward-looking basis to see, okay, how will the policy shocks impact the most vulnerable people in, in, in Zagreb and then of course what turned out to be was that we when we started the program back in so the outlines of the of the of the program where uh, a bunch of smart people are working on it colleagues from door colleagues from our regional energy agency and various other departments in the city uh, when we started the, the discussions um, there was no war yet inflation just started to pick up a bit and then as months started rolling, uh, we saw that basically the whole world went crazy. And what we need to do here m much, I mean, the scope got expanded really, really quickly. So uh, there's a lot, I will say, riding on the, on the, on the success or failure of the, of the energy program, of the energy poverty mitigation program. We hope to get it done by the end of this year because it's naturally linked to the, uh, to the budget planning process. So everything we do basically needs to be linked and measured and balanced, as they say, and, and, and negotiated in the city assembly uh, during the fiscal year 2023 preparations. So we hope to have a, let's say, a good start in January 2023, uh, where the program will encompass various measures known to, I think, most of you from you know, soft measures in terms of education and, and, and some form of light support all the way to social housing programs and energy retrofits and everything. So on that note, it's a huge challenge to be the capital city uh, because on the one hand, we are the most developed in the country in terms of, you know, Zagreb's, I think GDP is, I think 118% of the EU level. So we are, let's say, in the advanced scale when you when you look at the when you look at the average EU level on the on the uh, uh, NUTS two or NUTS three region level. But of course, then 
by design, the inequality in the city is, of course, wider. So there's a lot riding on it, uh, and I think we'll have a good outcome. It will not be the perfect one. It will not be the definitive one, and that's, I think, what needs to be stressed here. Documents such as this or programs or strategies such as these are, are ever-evolving, and they need to be measured, and they need to be re-evaluated, and they, they should not be set in stone, and they, should look, and they should be looked at critically, primarily by those people who wrote them. Uh, and then when we launch in 2023, basically that will be the start of a, of a rolling uh, yearly evaluation and re-evaluation re of our success because if things changed from January to June of this year this much, you know, I, 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 I'm not at liberty to even project what will happen in, 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 in September or even December of this year. So uh, humility is key. Um, and, but I, you know, the goal is clear. We know what we need to do and hopefully we'll get it done. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, those presentations. It, it is very inspiring. Um, hello everyone, my name is Andrea Vornicu. I represent the Center for the Study of Democracy Romania. Um, this is a think tank affiliated to the largest Romanian university, Babes Boyoi. And uh, we were, in a way, the pioneers who started the study of uh, energy poverty in Romania. So after uh, grasping the phenomenon some years ago, we realized that um, there is more story <laughs> to be told. And uh, even though uh, we analyzed the data, national data, Eurostat data, um, we, we figured it out that energy poverty brings together several variables related to the income, related to the buildings, related to the fuel households used in Romania, uh, then to the capacity of the administration, local administration and national administration, and also Romania, as other countries, has extreme forms of um, energy poverty that are correlated with informality. So um, in terms of income, um, Romania and Bulgaria are uh, the European countries that have the lowest income, and this, in a way, it is uh, reflected also um, in the capacity of people of paying their energy bills and also on how many uh, households uh, fall under the poverty line after they, they pay, pay the energy bills. For the 2020, uh, the data indicate that um, one-third of the Romanian households pay more than 10% of, of their income on energy bills. Um, and around 10 percent fall, uh, um, fall under the poverty line after they, they pay their energy bills. Um, in terms of the buildings, and we insist a lot on buildings, um, Romania, as other Central and Eastern European countries, is a former communist country. Um, and this comes with its own characteristics. So uh, a large part of the urban buildings are um, communist building, uh, panel type, uh, multifamily building blocks, which are highly inefficient. And you need to consume a lot of energy to keep the house warm during winters, and also a lot of energy to cool them down, especially in the southern area, but nowadays even in the northern parts of Romania. Um, also, it's not only the urban area that it is affected by, uh, by energy poverty, it's also the rural area, and around 80% of the rural households use wood for heating. Um, some of the buildings um, um, were built in the 70s, 80s, or 90s, are quite old. Um, the materials used uh, were natural um, wood or, or other natural materials that are not necessarily very good. Uh, and in terms of rehabilitating, um, some costs indicate that uh, for some uh, specific remote areas, rural remote areas, um, it costs more to rehabilitate the house than its actual uh, market uh, value. Um, in terms of fuels, um, urban communities, urban areas uh, rely a lot of, on gas. Um, either district heating or um, individual boilers. Um, and rural areas use mainly, mainly wood. And even the ones that uh, were connected to the gas infrastructure in the 90s, 
um, during the last winter they decided to use wood as wood is bought informally and it has a different price so it's not on the uh, on the market on a legal form um, now in terms of uh, the extreme uh, uh, cases of informality and extreme cases of, um, of poverty energy poverty uh, we don't have clear numbers of how many households confront with uh, extreme energy poverty, but what we know is that um, um, usually um, communities at the outskirts of the big cities, um, usually Roma communities, don't have access to electricity or connect informally to electricity, so they create informal markets. Um, also, uh, there are remote rural areas who don't have access to, to electricity, um, so um, it is in a way hard to map, to map how many households are there, uh, but qualitative study indicate that there is a phenomenon happening both in rural and urban areas. And now going to the low administrative capacity, um, during our studies we realized that if big cities like Cluj Napoca or Bucharest or other cities have the administrative capacity to attract both national and European funds and invest in thermal rehabilitation, um, this case is not happening or it's not similar to um, smaller uh, urban communities uh, where there is no institutional capacity or, um, and this leads to an increased uh, inequality among um, areas in Romania and among, even among urban areas in Romania. So within this uh, very broad context that all puts pieces of, on the puzzles of energy poverty, um, this year we launched the Romanian Observatory of Energy Poverty because we realized that um, us as social scientists uh, we cannot deal completely with, with the phenomenon. So we brought together in the team um, experts on buildings, experts on uh, energy efficiency. Uh, we brought uh, persons who have um, the experience on working with uh, governmental, various governmental bodies, experts on, um, on energy. Um, then we have um, uh, various experts on social affairs who have also experience in lobbying uh, various authorities. Um, urbanists who have a better knowledge on how to better plan the urban territories um, and also um, and I think this is a really great thing we managed to to bring in the team um, a former Minister of Finance uh, who has a really good understanding on um, on what are the costs of doing all this kind of intervention that we are talking about so within this um, this team of people, uh, we start uh, organizing meetings uh, once a month or once at two months. Um, and based on the meetings, at each meeting we discuss various topics, we try to understand indicators, what the data are telling us and what the data are not telling us because data are not par perfect but we use what we have. Um, and then uh, we draft opinion papers, we send opinion papers to mass media to educate better the, the general public and also to various decision makers. Uh, each meeting has a specific topic, so starting from understanding energy poverty to how to measure energy poverty and then how um, uh, to interact better, better with the authorities and then we will move also to, I think the last meeting will be in carbon pricing for the, um, for the next year and ETS2. Um, and the plan, um, because we are um, an NGO, the plan is to continue with this project and in the next year to involve um, uh, representatives from uh, local and uh, national administration. Um, and ideally, um, the Romanian Observatory will become an interministerial body um, under the coordination of someone from the Romanian government. So um, we we do believe that uh, uh, and we do believe that the Romanian Observatory should bring together experts from various ministries, starting from the Minister of Labor to the Minister of Energy to the Minister of Public Administration um, and the Ministry of uh, Environment. 
and create a task force, intergovernmental task force, and also bring together also people from local authorities who sometimes have actual better expertise in tackling energy in, uh, poverty. So these are the plans and this is what we have done so far. Thank you. If we go introduction round, it's quite long, no? Yep. <laughs> Just tell me <laughs> where to stop. <laughs> Yes, you know me. Still, my name is the same, Baiba Meltovica. So I represent the Economic and Social Committee. But apart from that, I represent also Consumer Association. And we were working on the STEP uh, project under Horizon 2020, Solutions Tackle Energy Poverty. And we came to very many um, good conclusions. I want to continue where Andrea started about Soviet block houses, because I think you know these houses. <laughs> And we were working on one of the opinions in Economic and Social Committee, uh, and we were turning attention because individual houses is somehow individual. So if you decided as an owner to, to refurbish your house, you just do it. But it's more difficult if you live in multifamily house, and it's more difficult if you live in um, a house that is built in Soviet Union times. So when we worked on one of the opinions, uh, it was shocking for, for other members of the committee when we brought example, because the massive block of all these houses were built in last century, 50s, 60s. We call them Khrushchev time uh, buildings. So I see that all the generation already recognize them. And you know what? Uh, Soviet uh, Union uh, promised that these buildings will stand for 50 or up to 70 years, not more. Actually, time is already finished. <laughs> if you look at the last century, 50s, 60s, it's already over. So, so basically, uh, at the moment, uh, we are in the circumstances where multifamily house owners need to come together and make a decision together and make this will to renovate these houses. Otherwise, municipality cannot do anything. You can confirm me if I'm not right regarding the uh, Croatia, but usually this is the case. And usually it's, it's difficult because in this multifamily house you have different social groups. So you have youngsters who would like to see their neighborhood and house more bright. You have families with children. You have different social groups. You have also pensioners. You have also people without, uh, so people facing uh, unemployment. And in many of these cases, these people are saying, I'm fine. I'm fine with the building as it is. I don't want to invest anything. So the question is how we come together to this common, common decision, because this is a quite difficult. So we faced really in the project step uh, solutions to tackle energy poverty uh, with this problem that we need really uh, make somehow more attractive or closer to citizens these fundings. Not saying there is funding and, and please write your project. I mean. It's not possible, really. You need really advisor. You need really help. You need these one-stop shops that I mentioned in introduction part. Uh, and you need local municipality help. So we went through this way, actually, in this project. We went through local municipality going really on the ground and trying to go step by step how it is to go through one, go through one of the cohesion funds with all the with all the process, starting with evaluating uh, the heat losses in the house, step by step. And of course, it took uh, years. It took two years to get to the end result. So it's not quick solution. So if you're thinking about the winter at the moment, it will be like, um, like Eero said. <laughs> First, you need to really manage your house. You need to isolate or refurbish your house. And then you can think about the solar panel. And then you can think about any other renewable energy uh, technologies uh, that you can use. So you see this kind of practicality sometimes, I mean, it's, it's easy to say, let's go for energy transition. But for ordinary people, it doesn't say anything because they are connected to this heating system. You cannot just switch off your heating because you are part of the system. <laughs> if you close your system, it means uh, you are interrupting all the house. 
and then you're interrupting probably your municipality. So, so there are many practicalities on the ground and we need to really underline them because it's, it's, not, it's, not, so, it's not so easy. So I will, I guess, stop here and uh, yeah, <laughs> with introduction. <laughs> Hello from my side. Uh, my name is Georgos Kukufikis. I'm uh, uh, working in the European Commission at the Joint Research Center and uh, I'm leading a team that works on the social aspects of the energy transition. Uh, and naturally, energy poverty came uh, in our desk as uh, a domain of work and research uh, the last one, two years when we started uh, collaborating uh, closely with uh, EPA and Thanks for the invitation and the possibility to be here and the organization and uh, the local hosts. Uh, I had some other speaking points, uh, but uh, I want to speak about how exper experiential is the phenomenon of energy poverty. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that we uh, may be on the same society, uh, on the same country, on the same social group and experience it, it differently and we, we develop different perceptions about it. Uh, and uh, I'm saying that because now we are all in the same room, we experience uh, a heat wave, uh, and uh, like 40 minutes ago, I was part of a different social group, a different social class, uh, the uh, audience one. Uh, and there I was sweaty, I wanted to uh, drink water, I, I couldn't really stand a lot uh, inside this room, very warm room. And then uh, social mobility came and now I'm part of the speaker social class and magic happened because beside, behind us it's their condition. So basically we enjoy here something that you cannot feel. Uh, we are very cool, we don't sweat, we don't have any uh, thermal discomfort. Uh, and this is very important. This is very important because we are in the same room and we experience something in a very different way. And this is what happens in society. Uh, people from different classes, from different social groups, from different countries, from different climatic conditions experience this phenomenon or not. Uh, and it's a highly uh, personal experience as well, uh, because also biologically we are different. So it's very important to have that in mind when we speak about energy poverty beyond indicators or policy measures. Uh, and it's uh, very different the measures and the indicators we will produce having different experiences. Uh, as long as I'm here in this uh, part of the room, uh, I will uh, not create the, the right uh, uh, indicators and policy measures to address the phenomenon. If I go back there, I will uh, have a different experience and have a different uh, understanding of the phenomenon. So that was, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the experience I want to share with you, and I think it's highly relevant. The second is something that uh, Joao actually mentioned uh, during the coffee break, and this again experiential because he mentioned, okay, now today we can actually talk about uh, the inability to keep a house cool, uh, while usually we talk about the inability to keep a house warm, and how southern territories uh, in the EU experience uh, heat waves uh, and the energy poverty there can mean that you don't have an air condition or you cannot pay the bill for the air condition. Um, after this uh, change in my speaking points, I want to say that uh, we work uh, at the GRC uh, on trying to translate the energy poverty indicators that we use at the EU level and uh, mainly uh, we work on microdata of the EU Silk Survey and try to disaggregate the data in lower spatial uh, and social categories so we can have a better understanding of where energy poverty lies in Europe and what type of social groups are affected. Uh, we uh, work a bit on behavioral change related to energy poverty and how we can uh, find uh, tools or, or tips to help uh, citizens uh, address the phenomenon. We work uh, on the relationship between energy communities and energy poverty and how energy communities may be a tool to uh, address uh, the phenomenon as well. Uh, and of course, uh, with the collaboration with the Cabinet of Mayors, uh, GRC is uh, always mm, present and assisting uh, on the pillar of energy poverty of the Cabinet of Mayors. Uh, beyond that, uh, since I'm working on indicators, uh, 
I want to say that we observed, uh, we observed in 2020, the first pandemic year, basically, uh, after uh, eight or nine years since 2012, uh, the first rise in the European level of energy poverty uh, in, in our indicator set. So uh, since 2012, it was reverse, the first time that the trend of decreasing energy poverty is, is reversed. Uh, it's 0.5% the indicator across Europe on the inability to keep the house warm up. And someone may say 0.5 is nothing. I would say it's 1 million households. Uh, and uh, this is only 2020. We expect a higher rise for the 2021 data, even higher for the 2022 data. And we all know that the winter will be difficult next year if the geopolitical uh, situation remains as such. Uh, so, for all of us that we work in this domain, uh, from a research point of view, from a policy point of view, from the local uh, uh, authority point of view, from the NGO point of view, uh, it is, uh, we are kind of, of in the spotlight at the moment, uh, or we are not necessarily, because a lot of people don't understand energy poverty, even if they speak about uh, the, the, the rise in energy prices, but they don't necessarily speak about energy poverty phenomenon. But in any case, uh, these are very interesting times for uh, research and policy on this domain. And what I want to say is that, as the uh, famous quote is, uh, never uh, waste a good crisis. It's an opportunity, uh, unfortunately, but it's an opportunity to bring the agenda higher uh, and uh, make uh, a higher impact with our work and uh, with our proposals and our policy measures. And uh, yes, indeed, the last month the EU uh, uh, tries uh, to, to really bring forward a, a, a combination of climate and uh, energy uh, sufficiency, let's say, for the block strategies uh, that could uh, and are taking into account energy poverty. Uh, and indeed, we will see for the first time very soon the member states to report on, uh, on specific energy poverty indicators and the progress they made uh, via their national energy and climate plans. Uh, and the Commission sets up also now uh, a coordination group to support uh, member states on uh, policy measures on the energy poverty and uh, on vulnerable consumers. So uh, there is a crisis, but again, uh, we can try to take advantage of it and uh, bring uh, the positive items of the agenda higher. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I think you've made my job more difficult instead of easier because, uh, yeah, the bar is high. I'm Thais Gonsalves. I work at the G-Employment um, at a recently created unit in the G-Employment called Fair Green and Digital Transitions. So I guess this says a lot about the angle that, uh, that I'll bring in here today. Um, as you know, under, under the G-Employment we have this, uh, this, this compass, which is the European pillar of, of social rights and its 20 principles. And uh, principle 20 establishes the access to essential services, which include energy and transport, um, but also another important and interrelated um, service, which is digital communications. Um, so within the employment, I would, I would say that we work in synergy with our colleagues uh, who, who, who work on the, specifically on principle 20 and the access to to essential services. Um, in our unit, uh, which was recently created, we will turn one year old very soon, so we are, we are still learning to crawl, I would say. Um, we work on, on the distributional impacts that I personally work on the green side, that the green transition um, can have. So it, uh, it all started with the big package that many of us have already uh, referred to today, uh, the Fit for 55 package and uh, the, the distributional impacts that uh, measures to, to tackle climate change could bring. And out of those, of course, it's energy but also transport poverty. Um, so 
in within within this big package, we proposed a, a, a proposal for a council recommendation. And here our work is to, to provide concrete guidance um, to member states on which policy packages they can put forward and implement to address employment um, and, social, and the social impacts of, of the transition. Um, on, I will, once we go into the debate, I'll enter it further, what we specifically envisage for, for, for energy poverty, but also transport poverty. Um, but uh, since we are talking a bit about numbers and indicators, um, I would like to highlight that uh, just on the 16th of um, June, um, employment and social affairs ministers have uh, raised the bar. So we had set uh, a headline target um, to tackle uh, poverty and to reduce by 15 million, um, while member states increased the pledge by a bit. So now we're talking about um, 15.6 million fewer people at risk of poverty and social exclusion in the EU, and this shows um, minister, minister's commitment and our commitment to, to reduce poverty in the EU. At the same time, when we speak um, about energy poverty and also in the light of this uh, unprecedented events that we are again living, um, I would like to, to draw the attention to, to another, another number because while it is important to look at data um, on all income deciles, so while we are discussing the inability, for instance, to keep houses warm, um, and how it affects, in particular, people at risk of poverty, we see that there are an important impact um, in the middle class. Um, so just to quote for the EU-27, uh, EU only 53% of the population unable to keep home adequately warm was in the first two income deciles, and 26.1% of it was in the income deciles four to seven. So this shows that the topics that we are discussing here are, are, will increase importance when we reach also people in, in other income deciles. Um, and this uh, upward pressure that we are seeing in, in prices does draw our attention to there and how we need to raise awareness even further about the issue that, uh, that we are discussing. Another uh, two numbers that I would like to bring in is that um, while we do discuss harmonized indicators and harmonized definitions for, for energy and transport poverty, um, what we realized from, from our research that was backing um, the proposal for a council recommendation is that we need, and this we discussed here, need for granular data um, and, and the need for uh, local level and regional level data and also uh, the outcome of projects like yours um, are doing because if we look again to the inability to keep houses warm um, in the EU it ranged from 1.5 percent in Austria to 27.5 in Bulgaria so also when we discussed with member states while we were discussing our proposal for a council recommendation there are very different perceptions on the urgency to debate these issues but also on the ways to deal with it. So I think this is, is the key message and, and, and the importance of having a debate at the local level here today because when we discuss policies in, in, our, in our Brussels bubble, as we say, um, we, we, we try to, to, to provide a common ground for, for, for member states, but the local level is very important because we're talking about a big, uh, a big uh, difference between member states. Uh, and yeah, that's the latest message. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, <clears throat> obviously, we have prepared a lot of uh, questions in case you won't say anything, but uh, mm -hmm. we would prioritize you. So uh, I'm sure that you've been scribbling down notes about all the things that's been said here, and now is the time for you to pose these questions that's been sort of circulating in your minds in the warm room. So uh, hands up, and uh, then we will have a microphone passed to you. Mm -hmm. 
I see you put a lot of trust in the questions that we've developed from up here. Uh, Hmm. So maybe I say okay, okay. So so um, <clears throat> excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Clotilde Clark Foulquier. I work for Fianza, the European Federation of National Organization, working with the homeless. So we work on homelessness, but we work on housing and uh, the impact of the green transition, basically on the most vulnerable. And I would like to ask the speakers who mentioned the ETS2, particularly the, uh, Ivan. Um, I'm wondering, do you have projection on to the impact of ETS2 on the number of people who would fall into um, energy poverty or the social impact? Um, and this question is to other speakers as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, of course, not yet, because the process is not yet done on the, on the, on the EU level. Uh, I think that will be, honestly, in two years' time, time to then map out those. I mean, priorities have shifted. We started, like I said, uh, the little nugget that, that started the whole energy poverty mitigation program for Zagreb was the looming dark cloud of ETS for transport and heating in the residential sector, but, uh, but, but uh, again, priorities have shifted for now, so we will tackle that issue more in, the, in, 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 in depth later on, because again, when, when looking at what's, what's happening in, in, in the council, in the commission, in, in the parliament, goalposts are shifting, uh, more or less, so we're not that settled on where, I mean, I think the Polish Economy Institute, or, or the study that was done from the from the from from the uh, colleagues from Poland on the on the massive impact of the original proposal for the ETS2 introduction was massive, and without proper streamlining, without let's say assuring a soft landing um, for policies for I mean the social fund on my expert side of things is not enough, definitely. For all the good intentions that the Commission has, the, the pot of money available compared to the impact on, you know, on the, uh, the, the rising carbon price, the rising fuel costs, and, and even, even before the calamity of the war and, 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 and inflation, it was, it, it was really, really a tough exercise. So I think in the next, honestly, decade, that will be um, one of the make it or break it policies of, of the 2030 target for, for uh, Europe. Uh, so I think, again, to sum it up for Zagreb, I think realistically in two years' time we'll have the, not just the outlines of the final proposal or hopefully the final proposal itself, but more or less the capability uh, on the local end to then map the whole city in terms of, okay, when this thing comes online, 2026, 7, 9, 2029 is now in, in, in the discussions of a, some, some form of a delayed impact on the, on the households. Either way, whenever year it starts, uh, we'll have uh, hopefully the necessary capacity to do the analysis on a, on a you know, city region in terms of um, how does this impact what type of people here in uh, here in the city of Zara, but it's a very, very important issue. It's not the priority right now, currently, but it's something that's, you know, uh, going along uh, on, a, on a, let's say, separate path uh, while we develop the most urgent uh, exercises now. Thank you for the question. That's a raised hand in the front. Thank you. Um, a, a kind of follow-up, actually. I'm really been really interested to hear lots of people mention where they're getting money from or hope to get money from. I think we heard our, our host minister speak about using ETS1 revenues that are collected nationally. Bybid, you spoke about how difficult it is to hold, get hold of structural funds, for particularly at you know, uh, municipality or local authority level. You've mentioned the Social Climate Fund. Um, 
I'd be really interested to hear from, from Manuela and maybe Andrew and, and you, Ivan, as well, about where, where else <laughs> that you might be looking for, for your money, uh, for, for funds to deliver the kind of scale of projects. Is it, is it all looking up to European funds or, or, or is that not really where it's at for, for energy poverty alleviation? Just really interested to hear what's going on nationally. Um, I, I forgot to mention also Milan is part of the 100 uh, climate neutral city. I'm mentioning this because one of the aspects of the 100 mission cities is to raise money for investment. And the idea behind is not just to get money from uh, 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 European funds, but from the, the private investors. And the point for the cities to be part of this initiative is to get a label for which they are like attractive because they are committed to reducing the footprint for private investors. And this is also something we are now studying at local level. We, we work on for two years on the Milano Transition Fund 2026. It was included in uh, one climate kick, you know, the climate kick uh, finance projects. And the idea was to have a kind of contract, uh, APC contract. So but not at single building level, but once again at district level. So to refurbish uh, some more buildings in a small area, in a neighborhood, for example, sharing the same, uh, uh, I mean, the same uh, energy contract, the same energy provider, having uh, uh, refurbishing the buildings with the same similar approach, for example, with off-site technology, that is also a way to reduce the refurbishing costs and uh, having uh, repaid back the, the money for investment from the savings in terms of energy, but linking this to like uh, a commitment by the, the owners of the building to have a fixed uh, revenue, uh, sorry, fixed uh, rental for the apartments. So you keep the same rental and while you are reducing the footprint and the energy consumption, and so you can get repaid back for your investment. We are studying this model. We have done a test on a small district, and we are now trying to see if it is replicable. That is just an example. Um, I'll continue, not in such a positive note. Um, so in Romania, um, energy poverty is tackled from a um, social perspective, but in a very poor way. Um, actually, uh, the Ministry of Labor is issuing uh, heating subsidies each uh, winter for the vulnerable households. Um, and there is a threshold of income, uh, which is not necessarily updated with the inflation. So a lot of households that may be in need don't get any um, heating subsidies. So this is the governmental approach, the national approach. Now at local levels, municipalities, um, if they have enough funds, may decide to supplement these kind of subsidies. But this is the, like, the most common approach towards uh, the vulnerable households. Um, now, um, regarding the thermal rehabilitation, um, there were programs, so there were funds, uh, the operational funds from the former financial exercise, the European financial exercise, um, money attracted from the, uh, by the government and also attracted by the local authorities who had the capacity, and they decided the formula, um, how much money comes from the government, how much money comes from the local authorities, and how much money should the households uh, uh, put into this equation. Um, however, uh, energy poverty was not included as a target itself. So it was a measure uh, because uh, it was the discussion at the European level to improve the energy efficiency and also to decrease the greenhouse gas emissions. So it was, the discussion was more into this direction, not necessarily on, on the energy poverty. What happened is that, um, as, uh, as Baiba mentioned, um, it is extremely difficult, especially in former communist country, to generate agreement, consensus, and have trust among owners. Romania has 94% uh, ownership, and this is also post-communist transition legacy. Uh, so people could not agree, especially in multifamily building blocks, 
uh, on renovation. Some of them did not want to do this. And uh, the projects should have been applied by the owners association or tenants association. So building block, the entire building should have been renovated through a program, not individual um, households. Um, that is why uh, many projects were lost. Um, now, uh, there is an understanding that uh, thermal rehabilitation is really key on reducing, uh, reducing uh, the energy bills um, and uh, bits of renovation wave that are coming from the National Recovery and Resilience Plans will be injected, so um, let's see how it goes. But energy poverty is not included again as an objective. Even though bits of the funds, around 10%, will go to the most vulnerable households, but local authorities should ask money for this specific local household. So it, it, in a way, it is extremely complicated. Um, and I'm not very optimistic that actually um, a lot of uh, households in, uh, in energy poverty will benefit from it. Uh, but some of them may, but it, it is indirectly. Uh, so this is how it goes. Uh, from the ETS, it was another program, we called it uh, Casa Verde Plus, meaning the green household. Um, but it was especially designed for rural areas and single family units. Um, however, um, it was a precondition for the households to pay in advance all the expenditure. So again, uh, households in energy poverty could not do this, and they were not specifically targeted. So there was, there is no governmental solution for this kind of households. Private actors um, do not understand that um, uh, this kind of households are also consumers. Uh, so there is no interaction. Um, maybe some suppliers understand to to give some benefits, but it's not a clear consensus. So this is how it is. It, it's rather patching in solutions than addressing uh, systemically. Louise, thank you for the question. Uh, but I, I have an idea while listening also to my colleagues uh, speaking. Actually, we need to be a bit uh, probably proactive, uh, not reactive, because it, it's true. So we have these multifamily uh, block houses, and usually in these houses, uh, owners own apartments, but not the house. So when they join, when they are collectively gathering together, they are creating a legal body. Is it either it is NGO or it is uh, or it is other form of 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 body, and then they are solely becoming responsible for this house. Actually, in many cases, it's not so pessimistic as, I, as I, I, I draw up your attention because sometimes people really have money and they would like to see their house better. But you know what? Uh, they are struggling sometimes in the marketplace with construction companies, uh, with materials, because we know that at the moment this is not the right moment to renovate or refurbish house. So basically, there are not so many projects ongoing because uh, the prices are extreme. So I would say, and keeping in mind that municipality representative is here, uh, thinking about some construction companies or brigades or, I don't know, groups that could, I mean, could, could help consumers or help uh, inhabitants of these houses to renovate or refurbish their house on their own cost but they trust this company because it is certified or somehow comes from the municipality and, and, and of course probably some limited support can be granted via finances from the budget or, I don't know, EU funding. But going a little bit in different direction because nowadays the biggest problem is really this, that you don't have construction companies, you don't have engineers, you don't have uh, persons you can rely, you can trust that they will bring the project until the end. And, and, and this I heard from many people, even, even in even my parents' generation, they would like to do something, 
in order to, to refurbish their houses, but uh, they don't know how. And this know-how is uh, something that we, 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 we can help. Okay, so a quick overview of basically a really, really big far-reaching question is, well, yeah, in terms of funding, um, I won't say it's an it's a big issue. I mean, depending on what you do, um, the way we look at it is that, of course, hopefully when the program comes online, quote unquote, in January of 2023, most of the quick quick and, and, and let's say the most needed solutions will of course be funded by the budget itself. So the city of Zagreb's budget is big, comparatively speaking, um, 2 billion euros more or less, uh, but it's spread across a host of entities and users and, 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 and codependencies, etc. So uh, when I look at it systematically, of course, energy vouchers, uh, various you know, little to medium in social interventions can and should be done by the city budget because I think that's part of the city's policy. So it's, 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 it's part of the overall city's social policy. And some of those things, of course, can be combined with the structural funding in terms of European Social Fund or ESF Plus, which will be called in the 2021-2027 period. So we'll be, we'll be looking at on, 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 on how to mix and match those. Um, of course, the recovery fund and, and, and all its initiatives. Uh, don't forget Croatia on a, on, a, on, a, on a GDP per capita basis got the most money out of all EU27 states from the recovery fund because when you combine the operational program and the recovery fund for Croatia it's close to 24.7 billion euros for for the for the next period um, 2026 in terms of the recovery funding and then 2030 of course for the operational program so that's that's a lot of money for a country of three and a half million people um, but the way these things need to be discussed and structured are, again, depending on the type of intervention is needed. Um, I think since energy, uh, ener energy poverty and, and subsequently energy mitigation, uh, energy poverty mitigation is, is inherently a social policy, or at least part of the social policy of a, of a m m regional municipality or city. A uh, big chunk of that funding will come from the budget itself, hopefully. We'll see how the political process in the, in the city assembly goes. But of course, we'll try to find a way to combine uh, various funding sources available, uh, uh, known and unknown, basically. But for the more complex issues of, uh, let's say, developing social housing, uh, those are, I think, very well understood from our end on, on, on how to structure, design, and fund those. So we're talking multilateral development banks. Of course, the EIB is the one that's that's naturally coming up uh, in terms of funding and, and providing attractive funding for developing, honestly, blocks of social funding, uh, of uh, social housing uh, uh, blocks and apartments. So we're talking thousands of, 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 of social housing apartments that can be done within a reasonably um, quick time frame. So we have some discussions ongoing uh, uh, on both how to structure, again, it's, it's, it's a pie with numerous funding sources uh, on top of each other. So the commission likes to say and, and, and promote um, additionalities and blending and everything. And we think we have the formula cracked on how to combine both the, you know, the operational program and the recovery funds with the, let's say the credit line from the EIB. So the way these things will go primarily, at least now, when we look at, 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 you know, what part of the energy mitigation poverty program will be, let's say, the most capital intensive is, is of course, the construction of new, of new social housing units. But that is something that is really important to the current government in power. So that is something that has, uh, again, the multiplier effect of, of, you know, not just providing construction jobs and, and, and tax revenue and everything, but also setting the record straight on how the city can actually provide 
the because honestly the city of Zagreb never had a well-defined social housing policy the city I think itself has close to 8,000 apartments in its in its ownership more or less don't don't don't, don't quote me on that but close to 8,000 but it, it, it's it's spread among you know different city offices different programs different types of users different so it, it, the first thing to do of course is to have a good inventory of, of, of you know what's 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 there um, part of that let's say mapping activity will be done during the development of our of our uh, energy poverty mitigation program but the funding is again it's not it's not so much of an issue uh, to on, 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 on how to how to structure the project of course you need to be aware for at least for the city of Zagreb um, maybe some colleagues from other capitals of, of, of Europe have the similar problem have the similar similar uh, problem the city of Zagreb is for Croatia massively overdeveloped and city of Zagreb unfortunately even though from 2022 to 2027 is finally its own nuts three nuts three statistical region according to Eurostat, which means city of Zagreb basically, uh, and all the EU funding policy wants will go, aha, now uh, city of Zagreb can have its own operational program, basically. Um, it doesn't so far, because it's, it's a relatively new change and it involves, you know, numerous reshufflings among the national level. Why am I stressing this? Because City of Zagreb, for most of the recovery funding and operational, uh, uh, operational program funding, the national government is in a conundrum. They know that the City of Zagreb is a huge KPI, so we can do a lot of things because we have administrative capacity, our own budget is good enough to cover any sort of funding gaps, so the City of Zagreb can pool a lot of weight in terms of EU funding. On the other hand, um, how can we give money to the city of Zagreb? They are rich on their own in terms of the country as a whole. So it's a delicate balance of how to uh, marry national priorities, KPIs and everything with the potential to absorb EU funding via the capital city of course because they have the machinery they have the people they have the tools they have the land the projects they have everything ready so it's a delicate balance uh, which is again known to most of m most of you coming from, from uh, coming from the capital cities uh, across across europe but again it's something within the city of zagreb i think we can do honestly we can do a lot of on, on our own it's just a matter of um, aligning the policy we do with the other initiatives that the city needs to do, and of course, the, the, all the initiatives that the government itself is, is basically uh, structuring. Thank you. I think we have one question from the corner. Yeah. And that may be the last question if there's nobody raising their hands now. There's two questions. Any higher? <laughs> All right, two questions. Yeah, I want to be a bit provocative and maybe spark the discussion to tomorrow to the workshops. So we are on a climate emergency. We are on an energy emergency. We are on a social emergency. We have billions of euros coming from the recovery and resilience plan. Um, we are seeing projects and not only research and, and, and EU funded projects, but we are seeing the money application for renovations and integration of solar. So early on, uh, the colleague mentioned the solar before the insulation. That's what I'm, I'm bringing now. So we are seeing, in I'm coming from Portugal, from Nova University of Lisbon first, and also I'm a part of EPA team on coordinating the research and indicators part. So maybe for the colleagues from the DD, DGs, just to, to set the scene here. So we see that probably 98% of the money coming from the recovery and resilience plan are going for climatization, solar PV, and if we are lucky, to windows. So we have the renovation wave. We have studies from other parts of JRC, from other institutions, showing that we are not going for deep energy renovations currently. We need that. We need to increase, double, triple the renovations. And when we go on the ground, on probably all of our countries, I'm giving the example of Portugal, we are going for the easy things. Why? 
because, as the colleague from the city of Zagreb mentioned, the countries need KPIs to report to the Commission. So fast and furious spending the money. Because if we are going to the difficult things, reaching to the most vulnerable, reaching to the energy poor, that's difficult. And we are not doing that. We are spending the money fast on whatever. And we are doing solar, it's fine. We are doing windows, it's fine. But it's not the things we really need to do. And what, just some thoughts about this. Thank you. <laughs> okay, you are a bit unlucky though, Joao, because uh, I come from the GRC, which is the research DG. We don't design, we advise, and we advise also on that. Uh, that is true, but uh, member states are part of the co-design process. So it's not that the Commission uh, alone comes to the member states and tells them what they will report and how. Uh, usually, we know that uh, policy making at the EU level is part of compromises and part of trying to, to create something that can be applicable in every context across the EU, and that's what uh, makes maybe parts of this policy making process inefficient, and then we have uh, the indeed complex problem you described, but there's no necessarily easy answer to that. So indeed it was a good... Uh, uh, food for thought for tomorrow, but just to say something, also connected a bit to that and to the previous discussion on finance. Uh, what we see is that indeed there is uh, there is a possibility from citizens to to self finance projects, and uh, one of the problems we see is that now citizens have the expectations of state funding or EU funding, and even if they are ready and they have the resources to self finance interventions, they don't do it; they wait. Uh, and often they take funds from programs that could help uh, other households that are more in need, but they cannot access because uh, middle-income households, let's say, do that. So maybe there is also a need to discuss uh, 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 some some nudges uh, for people that are well off on uh, renovation. Uh, the other is that. Uh, the discussion on citizens' engagement, ah, by the way, also on finance, we have done a study in Greek islands uh, where we asked, uh, we, we've done a survey trying to assess the willingness to invest of the local population on, uh, on in particular, uh, that was for uh, ener renewable energy projects at the local level, the energy communities. And there we found, surprisingly, that uh, approximately 10% of the renewable energy investments needed for the islands uh, that we did the, the study for uh, could come directly from citizens. If the citizens, the citizens though, uh, first of all, they need to be uh, more informed of the possibilities and that discussion energy communities comes in. And also when we ask them to identify stakeholders which could be, uh, uh, let's say, in charge but also uh, helping them to do uh, or to, to invest their own, let's say, resources to projects like that, they identified municipalities as the number one uh, stakeholder that could be next to them and they trust. So we do have some sort of data uh, actually saying that there is also another uh, uh, another way of, of advancing and making higher uh, and uh, making faster the, the transition and the innovation of the building stock. If I may add a more institutional point. <laughs> um, so as I, I spoke before, we have this proposal for a council recommendation and, and the good side and the bad side are that the, the, the good side is that member states can adapt and can implement it um, according to their national circumstances. The, ba the bad side, so to say, is that it's a, not a, a legal framework, so we cannot force member states to act. A work you can do, we can raise awareness, and I think this is an important role that we're playing here today as well, to raise awareness that we have this concrete guidance on the employment and social aspects to the transition that offers concrete guidance to member states on how to address in a comprehensive whole of society approach um, the issue of energy poverty, but also all the interrelated issues also related to the green jobs. We spoke earlier um, that there are also informal learning and, and all these practices that we need to put in place. Um, so we also need to, to hold member states accountable. We, 
and, and projects and civil society movements and local authorities that they should use this guidance, for instance, in our recommendation, we strongly advise that in the revision of the national energy and climate plans, now that it's coming, that they use our council recommendation as, as a guidance to address the social impacts of, of the transition. So I think an important uh, role that we're playing here today is that, that we need to raise awareness that we have guidance to, to do it better to do it in a comprehensive way and we and member states need to use these instruments when drafting the NECPs and now hopefully if we ever get there the social climate plans and uh, and, and and so on so that's uh, that's the main message okay so on one quick comment regarding deep renovation and I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, be a cheerleader for a colleague here. I don't know if any of you know Mr. Peter Swetman and Climate Strategy and Partners. I, you know, uh, climate, uh, nods his head. I think Peter is the f most, uh, I mean, the authority to read on energy renovation and housing in, 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 in Europe. And more people should listen and read to his proposal on the European renovation loan concept a 30-year zero coupon interest deep renovation loan that would be backed sort of a next generation EU2 type of a thing where 25 to 30 thousand euros on a, on, a, on a property in order to do a full deep renovation of a house could be done and structured in a way that the user basically gets the money up front doesn't pay cash interest payments until either the property is sold or transferred or the coupon reaches its maturity in 30 years that kind of an instrument puts the i mean the collective power of eu borrowing down to the very household level which can then leverage that power to renovate its own home that it owns um, that is up until this date and i'm a policy one that, that like reads hundreds of pdfs per week uh, those types of concrete proposals are something that should be brought up to the fore much, much, you know, in a, in a much, much bigger way. That is, I think, one of the key instruments on how we reach especially deep renovation, where we don't necessarily rely on overall funding instruments from the national level, like you said, which are being spent in a more or less haphazard way, but putting the the, again, the power of the EU collective borrowing back to the back to the individual household, which can then leverage that power to finance its own actions, which contribute to EU goals. So it's a it's a it's a win-win. Thank you. Thanks, Ivan. Um, one last one last question. Yeah, I'll try to be very short. Uh, Alessandro Sbundo, the Italian Sustainable Investment Forum. Uh, first of all, sorry, I missed the first part of the uh, debate, so sorry if I repeat myself, maybe. Um, I, I think that my question partially is related to the, the previous one, um, and mainly about the involvement of, uh, um, of private investors and citizens as well. Uh, I think that um, Ms. Soyan partially uh, anticipated this part on the experience of, uh, of Milan. Uh, I believe that um, we are now plenty of innovative financing scheme, innovative uh, financial instruments that may support uh, local governments in uh, on both green, on both environmental and social aspects, from social housing to deep renovation of uh, houses. So, for example, uh, uh, local, green, local green bond or local uh, social bond, uh, some kinds of public-private partnerships. So, uh, my question is, what's your experience about this? Uh, going, trying to go. Uh, further with respect to um, EU financing schemes, so trying to involve all the private investors that are willing to support uh, the green transition and the social transition. It was not clear the question to me, because what I was ex now explaining was a pilot project we, we did. Because, but you know the situation today in Italy is a little bit different at present because we have this bonus from the government. That Yeah. 
Yes, that's something we are now going to study into more depth based on this uh, pilot project we have done up to now. So it, it's still under, ongoing. But I was, uh, no one mentioned the taxonomy in any case, because I think it's also, <laughs> it's also pushing in the, in the right direction of deep renovation. And also the Renovate Europe funds are somehow linked to the, to the taxonomy. So uh, theoretically from now on, I mean, there will be really an additional push to go for deep renovation instead of just uh, really easy interventions as it was mentioned before. But I don't know if there is any experience on this. It's just... I mean, I don't have a very much popular opinion of the taxonomy. I think it's a very well-intended idea that went haywire completely, especially in the, in the, in the past few months. Um, from a personal opinion, I don't think the taxonomy is that important, honestly. Most people who are in the business, from the mortgage lenders to the financiers, everyone, they know what they need to do. Um, not to this on the, on, the, on the work done by the working group and everything, but unfortunately, as usually things go, well-intentioned, science-based, uh, policy-based, document when it, when it enters the political fray it becomes a punching bag for various um, interest groups so the tectonic again from my standpoint taxonomy is not that of an important um, element which will you know break or make or break a certain policy element that the city can do uh, with regards to your question on uh, involving private investors in various activities well, uh, depending on the area, honestly, uh, the city of Zagreb is currently in the negotiation phase of a 40% city lighting reconstruction via an EPC contract with a private partner. So, of course, investors like energy efficiency and you know EPC-based activities. Sorry, uh, sorry. Okay, but. Uh, we have broad strokes on where, where we think the potential for investors is, especially in renovating public buildings, because that's our, under our um, jurisdiction, so to say. Uh, and we plan to do a lot with alternative funding models, as we call them, uh, in the 2021-2027 period, because that's what the Commission actually expects from Croatia going forward. So there are plans, but of course, we'll see how the market works. Thanks. And this was the answer to the last question. Uh, in, now it is, it is in, in my agenda there's a wrap up from my side, but I will make that very, very, very brief and just simply say that we will now continue. There is the poster session outside and I would very much like you to go and sort of be inspired by what will happen in these, uh, in these cities where the technical assistance from the Energy Poverty Advisory Hub is, has just started off. Um, and then I would uh, invite you to not to, I wouldn't like to wrap up this, I would like this just to continue. We can easily sort of walk out there and talk a bit to each other. Uh, there are a couple of interesting parts. It, it turned very sort of, uh, uh, it, it turned into a focus of, of investment for quite, for quite, quite a lot, which is interesting. Uh, there, there's like a sort of, a, sort of, sort of like some, some kind of a call for, for, for investment carrots, but at the same time also information on, ha on, on investment. And there's a lot of talks about uh, being innovative when it comes to, to this. And it, it's nice to see from the cities that you're really, you're really thinking out of the box uh, in particular. Uh, that was my wrap up. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that you can you can wrap up together and bilaterally, multilateral when you're out there. So let's go get some oxygen and some fresh air. But what is more important is that <coughs> uh, after the mingling part, uh, you need to be at 7:30. Huh? It's from seven. So the the restaurant is open from seven. Uh, and you will scan the QR code if you do not know where it is. Scan the QR code, it's on the door I see there and everywhere and that's where we have our networking dinner. You'll also see the information up here on this screen, no? Come here. <laughs> yeah. I'm basically just lip syncing here with my, uh, with my colleague Dimitra who knows much more about this so you can also just ask her.
she's the one with the belly. And that is the, uh, that will be the last word of the day, at least the last official words of the day. And I would like to thank you all to the panels here. Uh, and, but, but not sort of, I, I hope that you'll continue. Uh, and also thanks to all the official speakers and thanks to all the listeners. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and see you out there in the lobby where there's a bit more nicer temperature.